It's so great to see everybody um, so energized and ready to hear about art. And um, this is a, a packed house for an all-day symposium, and it's so great to see some familiar faces. Folks that have come from Conway, folks that have come from Little Rock, some folks even from the, the East and the West Coast. I am Anne Crabill. I'm the Director of Education and Research and Learning, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Art and Conversation, Environment, Identity, and Memory. Before we get started, just a little housekeeping. I'd like to make sure everyone turns their phone to silent. But I would also like to make sure that everybody uses that phone to um, communicate via social media, via Twitter, using the hashtag CB Symposium. So please keep the conversation going in social media. First, I would really like to thank our sponsors, Christie's. Christie's has been a valued corporate sponsor since our beginning. Their exclusive sponsorship of the symposium reflects the company's commitment to advance the appreciation and understanding of art through quality educational programmings. We are grateful for their ongoing support, encouragement, and belief in our museum's mission. Representing Christie's is Eric Whiting, Deputy Chairman. <laughs> Yasmin Dejunik, Client Strategy Director. <laughs> and Sarah Freelander, Post-War and Contemporary Specialist and Department Head. Thank you again. This is, you can see this is really a program that this community is so appreciative to have here in Bentonville, Arkansas. So in anticipation of this event, there was some lively discussion and chatter on Facebook as to whether this program was too political in nature, which led to a very healthy debate about the role of art appreciation and whether or not that should mix with politics. Personally, well, and maybe I can speak for, for most of us working here, um, we believe that art to some degree is political in nature. All art, right, to some degree is political in nature. But this program was really not designed in response to the current government or the political news that really is the backdrop of our everyday lives lately. It was really our intention to create a program that considered how artists respond to and shape the issues of their day and how those issues connect to issues of the past. And so you'll see this kind of unfold in our, our conversations where we have art historians who really connect the early works in our co collection to contemporary practice today. The panel discussions will consider how American art has been informed by artists' relationship with the natural world, how artistic explorations of identity is shaped by multicultural exchange, and how memory, which is often at odds with history, informs artistic practice. Through these discussions, we will see how the issues are not unique to our time, but have, considered, have been considered for decades, if not centuries. Prior to each panel, our poet in residence, Susie Q. Please welcome Susie Q. She will prime our thinking with a spoken word performance. And then following each panel, we'll have time for questions and discussions. So there's a microphone up here, and we would just ask when it is time for questions and discussions to cue yourself up in the aisle so that you can um, participate in this dialogue. We welcome a diversity of thought and perspectives in an environment that is respectful. So before we get started, I have some thank yous. Uh, first, please, a huge round of applause and thank you to our volunteers. Without them, we could not pull this off. Second, thank you to Sarah Siegerlin, our Adult Public Programs Manager, and Janelle Redlasic, our Head of Public Programs, for all of their work in helping to make this uh, program come to light. I'd also really like to thank my curatorial colleagues for all of their heavy lifting in making this program happen and facilitating the panels. Chad Alligood, our Curator of Contemporary Art, Lauren Haynes, our Curator of Contemporary Art, and Mindy Bisa, our Curator of American Art. And a thank you to Margie Conrads, our Director of Curatorial Affairs, who will give us some concluding thoughts and you know, pull all of the ideas together that we hear throughout the day. <laughs> to get us started, I would like to welcome Lauren Haynes in conversation with Neri Ward, whose artwork, We the People, a new acquisition for Crystal Bridges, will frame our thinking for the day. Welcome Lauren and Neri. Good morning. Morning. 
So um, as Anne mentioned, we are gonna give a little bit of a starter to the day, focusing on Neri's work, We the People, that is on view in our contemporary galleries, and also is the last image in the booklet. I realize we don't actually have a slide of it. Right. So um, for that reference, we'll be able to look into the booklet. And really what we're gonna talk about is really setting up the context for this work and Neri has picked some great slides to give us some information, and we'll talk about this idea of how this work evolved, some of the formal elements, and really thinking about, particularly in the context of the rest of the conversation, what this work means, meant when it was created, what it means here, and what it means in really every context as we think about the power of art. Does that, does that yeah. sound good? I think the, the goal for me, oh, thank you, for, uh, I'm excited to be here. Glad that uh, you guys, and it's a wonderful day, uh, chose to come inside and hear us speak. Um, I've always heard about Crystal Bridges and really wanted to come, and Chad, you had um, said you should come and check the place out. So first time coming here, so far it's amazing. Um, got a chance to see the work in, inside and I'm ex excited to talk about it. I didn't want to present the work in the talk because you know, I don't want to take away the magic of you seeing the work in, uh, in, for real. So what I chose to do was really, uh, what we want to do, is to just give you a, an idea of how the work evolved. You know, why would somebody stick shoelaces in a wall, <laughs> right? And, uh, and why would you choose this particular um, text? So that was, that's kind of what um, I want to give a grand, we want to give a granding in the artist's choice, is my choice, um, and what, that means for the work, but also what the context and um, maybe even the, the backdrop of our current situation might mean for the reading of the work, um, which is for me always very interesting and surprising. So, so we should probably uh, show yeah. that you wanted to do that? Yeah. So, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm an artist who uses materials, generally I use materials that I find on the street, and sort of everyday objects and try to find a way to talk about what these things are, what they were, and tell a story around um, the expectation for them. So this is, uh, you'll see this in a lot of urban spaces, a lot, um, you know, maybe even here. If somebody um, buys, passes away, is, is killed, there'll be a kind of street side memorial. Sometimes they do it on a highway, sometimes you'll see uh, if somebody gets hit. And this idea of trying to, um, to have a marker for this absence is something that I was really intrigued with. And I, and I noticed that in a lot of these street memorials, there's always the flowers, there may be a picture, there's a, a, some image, a narrative, I miss you, or maybe an image, yeah. And then there's also liquor, you know, alcohol. No, and I thought, this is really interesting. You know, as an artist, this is the stuff I sit around thinking about. That even in, in our religion, our kind of official religions, alcohol is um, this element of transformation, this rite of passage, right? Catholicism is wine. Um, in other areas, is rum. So it made sense that, and they alcohol the spirits, right? And so the, also the idea that it's this material that um, is made from a kind of fermentation a breakdown of material chain from one, um, one material com component to the, another chemical component. So I'm, it's exciting to think about that as an artist. And I wanted to find a way to give that a visual voice. And so, let's, the next slide. Um, so I started seeing these abandoned signs on buildings in my neighborhood, they're, they're liquor signs. And normally what happens is the, the liquor store is gone. And so the sign's too big to be removed, or too costly to remove, so just leave them and they no longer work. So, but I, I realized that within the word liquors is the word soul, and this space of the mystery of self, right? And so I started doing this work, the next one, where I was uh, flipping the sign around and only illuminating the word soul. So that was great. That was a great, um, for me, exciting possibility, but then I really wanted to add another moment where I could bring the body back into the conversation. So I started using shoe tips. And yeah, that's another one. Um, so the, the idea of bringing in the body through the shoe tips is like almost like a tiptoe to say, you know, f so it wasn't just a play on signs, it was a play on our relationship to that thing, our physical relationship and um, our materiality. So within that uh, are the shoe tips and the flowers and shoelaces. And the shoelaces and this was really about trying to um, create a form that would resonate with that translation between the flowers 
and the, the, the mass of the tips. And how did the shoelaces come into play? Did you test other materials or other no, things? No, it was just a logical step, right? I mean, you, I, I'm taking apart the shoes and I'm cutting them up and I usually don't like to throw anything away, so I, I kept the tongues and the laces. Um, because they're interesting, they're interesting uh, uh, for the viewer, you know, and I, they're interesting for my history with that material. So it just made sense. As a line, I actually, you know, my background is, um, a lot of people don't know this, I came out of, in grad school, I studied drawing. So the notion of a line being engaged was really exciting for me. And the next one. So this, I just want to show you. It got to a point where I decided to start taking these signs because one day were, um, it was almost like an archaeological uh, component where I wanted to, urban archaeological, where I wanted to sort of take them from the space. And the space of the name of the grocery store, like this one is called Radha uh, Liquor Soul, would be incorporated into uh, the, the, the work. Next. So that's the Radha. So I got an opportunity to do this project, and it was just particularly using the, the, um, the tips themselves. And the idea was to sort of play up that physicality of the material. So this is like a snowman shoelace, uh, uh, shoe tips, and tire threads uh, snowman, right? I mean, it was done in China. Um, I was just working on this project in China, and everything is done by hand there, right? You know, I, we had like, this was all built with the help of maybe like 10 or 15 uh, men because um, you know, everything is, it's easier to just hire people, to, except to move this stuff around. How long did it take? It was about four days. Um, and I realized that at a certain point, the gentleman that they hired, this, um, the space that hired, they really didn't want to go home. Like They wanted work. They really wanted to keep working. And so I didn't know what to do, because I really wanted to have them have something to do. So I told them to just start saving stuff, like, like the shoe laces, like the shoe um, tongues. And so I had a whole pile of shoelaces and shoe tongues left over that I was figured I'd send back to the States and do something with. Um, so this is the next one. Just a detail of the China Idol. And the next one. So this is what evolved. It was really, this is the first shoelace drawing that I did. And it, was, it really just came about uh, coincidentally because my gallerist came to me and said, you know, one of the artists couldn't make it. We have this huge wall that he was supposed to do something. Do you have any ideas? And I had the material, so I said, yeah, I'll do this piece. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like, you know, so what, what image do you choose? What image do you choose? So I decided I wanted to use something that would be iconic. And uh, I chose a star from the Chinese flag. Uh, each star represents something. I think there's three stars. And so this star was, uh, in that particular position, represent, represented the people. And so the idea that I would use the laces, which are sort of individual to somebody having used them and worn them, and then um, talk about a kind of communal dialogue of the group was really exciting to me. And I also liked, which is something that I didn't expect, this notion of a kind of movement, uh, almost as if thing is, is, is rising up. Yeah. So that, that uh, component, that, that notion of uh, weightlessness, um, apply, really for me as a sculptor was very exciting. At the same time, I want to talk about this piece because it, was, um, it wasn't until I got a, a, a commission to work with, um, a collaboration to work at the Fabric Workshop that I um, started working with the piece, the, the, the preamble, We the People, uh, and also doing this piece, which is uh, Our Rights as Citizens. This is basically, um, basically the citizen's rights, right? I mean, uh, my brother is a lawyer, and he, uh, I remember he, he worked for Legal Aid, and he had a... I use my business card that has this now. But he'd have a business card with the citizen's rights on it, and he would give it to his clients. And I thought, this is a cool thing. that you know, He has this service connected to his practice. And I wanted to do that, but as an artist, it didn't make sense. But I said, you know what? I like this. I think it's important that people know what their rights are. Yeah. So you know, for the last 15 years, my business card has always had our citizen's rights on it. And I, and I remember I'd give it to friends, and they would be a little bit taken back as if I was making a, an, some kind of um, accusation about their, um, yeah, you know, anyway, they, they would, there was a sense of something, if you have to um, show it, maybe you're guilty, right? I mean, yeah. unfortunately, that's, and I wanted to, I really wanted to, def, I, I really wanted to take that away from it. So I thought, well, I need to make a kind of a home sweet home version of it, a kind of yeah. homespun, crafty mm -hmm version of it. And so this is how that happened. And at the same time, the next one, the same time I was doing the project with, you can sort of see the detail of it, 
So the, the idea was, uh, I was doing the project with, this, um, with the Fabric Workshop, and we decided to do the We the People version. And my cho choosing that text was, one, I was in Philadelphia. That's where it was penned, and that was sort of context-wise it made sense. And also, I, I really wanted to use this language that people had, were taking for granted. Yeah. They didn't really think about what that means anymore. And I wanted to, the idea was to take this humble material, this, this mundane, quotidian material, and try to have it tackle um, a concept that people would have to re-examine again. You know? So this re-examining of this thing that we think we know was really at the heart of, um, of the interest in bringing it back to life. And the, the thing about the piece, when you see it in the space, it's really experiential in the sense that the reason I made it large scale is that you had to, there are moments where you're at the side and you can't quite, it's not quite legible. So depending on where you are, its legibility changes. And I thought that was uh, poetic, for me that was very poetic in terms of the notion of our relationship to government or even to community. And Mary, when you are thinking through this text and thinking through the Constitution really toning down to this idea of the preamble, did you ever go from a point where you're like, well, this will be a whole room size installation and do more words? Or was it the, this idea of we the people being the core part of it for you that stuck out? Yeah, it was more the, the we the people part as a kind of mountaintop of, it's this monolith of meaning that I think is really hard for people to, to see. And it was really trying to, to make them see it by making it more obscured, sure. right, in a way, so that you have to cr really consider what it means by slowing down your, your uh, experience with the, with, with the language, with the words, with the, with the letters. And so, and the fact that, in, you know, in, um, in the first one that I did with the, with the Fabric Workshop, it was, it was this homespun. Each lace wasn't, it wasn't a used lace. They were, they dyed the laces, and we were really cons considerate of how this, um, f on a formal level, how this text would be presented. Uh, and, and as I've started working with them, even in terms of having an exhibition copy for it, there's also the interest of having, it's evolved in terms of using used laces more, and also the building of it, who gets to build it, uh, the participatory component of creating the text has really become part of the work, that, in a way that I never expected. Yeah, and do you feel that each iteration really has its own identity based on the context that it's in and the location? Yeah, yeah, very much. Um, just to let you know that, you know, if you look at the title of the one upstairs, it's called the We the People Black Version, and it has nothing to do with race. <laughs> it's a mischievous part of me that left that in, but what happened was, when I was doing the, the presentation, and, and I said there's an, um, we've presented it in different places, like an exhibition version of it. Um, the curator called me and said, you know, oh, you know, we're thinking of painting the wall. Have you ever done it on a dark wall? And I was like, no, go ahead, let's, let's do that. And then once I got off the phone, I, I had to say, you know what, I should really change the colors because I was afraid that the wall would overpower the laces. So I called her and I said, let's get laces that have more color because uh, to, to compete with the wall, on a formal thing, it would need to, I would need to raise the visual volume of the laces themselves. So this one was not meant to live, but when I saw what manifest, it was such a, um, a different version, and I was really excited about the, the high key uh, component of the, the visual component of it that we decided to, to keep it. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the, another version that's on view right now at the New York Historical Society and the process behind Right, yeah. so I'm not, you know, I'm, I, this, this, is to bring, this is a lot of anxiety, because I didn't, I'm not a marketplace artist that, you know, like, thinks, okay, I'll keep making versions of this. And in fact, I didn't really want a, another version, right? Um, my gallery was like, can we do three or four? And, you know, I said, no, I think one's good. And then that accident happened with the black version, which I'm excited, um, don't get me wrong. So um, one of their patrons really loved this piece, and um, very strong-willed, uh, woman. So she came to the studio and I, I told her, listen, I'm not sure this is going to work. It's just not, you know, I already did two versions. She said, come, come and check out the space. And so we went there and she says, this would be a permanent piece. The only other permanent piece we have is uh, Keith Herring. So, um, so you don't have to worry about it infringing on the presence of the other pieces that you have. And and then that, the good thing is we came up to the conclusion that the only way that would make sense is that because they had an amazing education programming, if they could collect the laces from the school kids 
and actually talk about their, um, for all the historical societies across the country, this year their theme was citizenship. So it was like a really important, it would have been, it was an important uh, component of that educational uh, aspect to their uh, programming. So th we went ahead with it. And the, the, the children became part of building the piece and building the lace, bringing the lace, talking about citizenship. So for me, that was really exciting. And now the piece is going to be in their staircase. If you go to the one in New York, it will be um, on the, above the staircase as a permanent piece. So that was, uh, I was seduced, I have to admit it, <laughs> I, um, and uh, for good reason. And so it, it um, yeah, it worked out really well. Yeah. And do you feel that the, these ideas of this, the words, we the people, do you even feel in the few years since you started thinking about this piece, the idea behind that has changed and the yeah. those words? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to me because when I did the work, it was a sleepy text. You know what I mean? It's like, I was just in Philadelphia. I was, it was cobwebs, you know, I mean, not really, but it was, it was really, it was not really that considered. It was just um, a platitude of sorts, right? I mean, it was part of our history. It was part of our history, right? And, and we sort of, a uh, uh, history that we've sort in some ways taken for granted. And so, being that I was there, the, the, the directive was just, okay, I'll use this thing that seems to not be examined enough and see if I could use this very humble material to, to fill it out, to give it another kind of presence. And so now, you know, everybody that wants to talk about it wants to talk about the climate of the time. And I think it's, it makes sense. And I'm excited that the work resonates beyond the moment of creating. So um, the sense of it, who, questioning who, who are the people and what, are, what is our role in this democracy. I think all of those things are really fervently being discussed now. And I think that the piece resonates even more for that reason. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I think to maybe give a little sneak peek about because you're very busy. So we also really appreciate you coming out here and talking to us today. But can you talk a little bit about some of the projects that you're working on now, particularly what's happening at Socrates Sculpture Park? So yeah, I'm, I'm doing um, an outdoor commission work with uh, collaboration with Socrates Sculpture Park. It's a, it's a place that, um, um, long history, marks the Suvero, a uh, very important sort of modern um, contemporary uh, sculptor sort of helped to find, and now it's, I don't know if you know of the High Line, it's sort of a precursor of the High Line, it's a real interesting merger of public, uh, private art in, uh, foundation and public parks. And so they, they present works um, every year of emerging artists, uh, normally group shows. This particular time, in the third year history, I've been honored to be the only um, artist have done a, is gonna be doing a solo um, presentation in the park, this five acre space. So I'm doing a piece, it was interesting because I, when I got the opportunity, of course, unfortunately, my ego engaged and I said, yes, I'd do it. You know, even though I was doing this, this big show at ICA Boston as a survey show about the same time, I decided to do it. And I, have, I had set an idea of what I wanted to do, but I have to say that the political climate, I, I, made, I had to make an adjustment. Um, not because I'm a political artist that wanted to make people you know, it's not about pushing that in your face, but I wanted to raise questions. Um, I really wanted the work to resonate in a kind of more mysterious questioning space than the normal, um, the direction that I was going was much more about a kind of absurd uh, space of possibilities for the work. So you have to come and check it out. It's gonna be up to, it, start, it opens in the uh, end of April, and it'll be up to September, so if you're in New York, you can come and check it out. The, it, it, I'll just give you a little, um, a, a little bit of a teaser about it. It's about goats. Goat, the greatest of all times, the acronym uh, GOAT. So there's a lot of goats there. So if you like goats, or if you don't like goats, you should come and check it out. <laughs> Great. 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 Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you.